Hello friends, warm welcome from your mentor and RFA tutors to the Green Top Guidelines Summary of the Day. We are here to tell you about the management of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, the Green Top Guideline number 5, which was published in February year 2016. Let's see what this guideline say to us. Ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is a complication of fertility treatment which uses pharmacological ovarian stimulation to increase the number of oocytes and therefore embryos available during assisted reproductive technology. The exposure of ovaries to human chorionic gonadotrophin or luteinizing hormone following the controlled ovarian stimulation by follicle stimulating hormone underlies most cases of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. You will find this single best answer in many practice books. The increased vascular permeability leads to loss of fluid into the third space, manifesting as ascites or less commonly pleural and pericardial effusions. Women with severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome demonstrates hypovolemia with a typical loss of 20% of their calculated blood volume in the acute phase of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, a very important percentage for your exam. In cycles of conventional in vitro fertilization, mild ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome has been estimated to affect around one third of the cycles, while the combined incidence of moderate or severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome varies from 3.1% to 8%, an important exam question. The clinicians must remain alert to the possibility of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in all women undergoing fertility treatment and women should be counseled accordingly. In women presenting with severe abdominal pain or pyrexia, extra care should be taken to rule out other causes of the patient's symptoms. Clinicians need to be aware of the symptoms and signs of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome as the diagnosis is based on clinical criteria. Keep a note for your exam. What is a relevant history from a woman suspected to be suffering from ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? We need to take a thorough history, a time of onset of symptoms relative to the trigger, medication used for trigger, number of follicles on final monitoring scan, number of eggs collected, were embryos replaced? If yes, how many? polycystic ovarian syndrome diagnosed or not? What are the symptoms in the patient? Is she having abdominal bloating, abdominal discomfort, need for analgesia, nausea vomiting, breathlessness, inability to lie flat or talk in a full sentence, reduced urine output, leg swelling, vulval swelling, associated comorbidities such as thrombosis, the severity of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome should be graded according to a standardized classification scheme. The licensed centers should comply with human fertilization and embryology authority regulations in reporting cases of severe or critical ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome among their patients. Units that treat women with OHSS should inform the license center where the fertility treatment was carried out to promote the clinical continuity and to allow the license center to meet its legal obligations. An important single best answer. The most important part of this green top guideline is the table three, the category and the features. We have mild ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome friends moderate ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, the severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and the critical ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. We need to learn for a single best answer and extended match question features to pick up the best answer in exam. Abdominal bloating, mild abdominal pain, and ovarian size usually less than eight centimeter, it is going to be mild ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. But keep a note in exam, if it is moderate abdominal pain, nausea with or without vomiting, ultrasound evidence of ascites, ovarian size between 8 to 12 centimeters, it is moderate ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. When we talk about the severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, it's clinical ascites, oliguria less than 300 ml per day, hematocrit more than 45%, 
hyponatremia less than 135 millimole per liter hypoosmolality less than 282 milliosmol per kilogram hyperkalemia potassium more than 5 millimole per liter hypoproteinemia serum albumin less than 35 gram per liter ovarian size usually more than 12 centimeter it is going to be severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome Please keep a note, it would be clinical ascites in severe and ultrasound ascites in moderate. The critical ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, it stents ascites and hematocrit more than 55%. The white cell count, more than 25,000. Oliguria, anuria, thromboembolism, and acute respiratory distress syndrome as well. The fertility clinics should provide verbal and written information concerning ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome to all women undergoing fertility treatment, including a 24-hour contact telephone number. The licensed centers that provide fertility treatment should ensure close liaison and coordination with acute units where their patients may present. All acute units where women with suspected OHSS are likely to present should establish agreed local protocols for the assessment and management of these women and ensure that they have access to the appropriately skilled clinicians with experience in the management of this condition. Women presenting with symptoms suggestive of OHSS should be assessed face to face by a clinician if there is any doubt about the diagnosis or if the severity is likely to be greater than mild. Outpatient management is appropriate for women with mild or moderate OHSS and in selected cases with severe OHSS. Paracentesis of ascitic fluid may be carried out on an outpatient basis by the abdominal or transvaginal route under ultrasound guidance. The examination has to be general abdominal and respiratory. The investigations to check for the state and the classification of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, few additional tests might be required according to the symptoms of the patient. This table too is very important for your ASCII station. Women undergoing outpatient management of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome should be appropriately counseled and provided with information regarding fluid intake and output monitoring. In addition, they should be provided with contact details to access advice. Women with severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome being managed on an outpatient basis should receive thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin. The duration of treatment should be individualized taking into account risk factors and whether or not conception occurs. A very important single best answer. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents should be avoided as they may compromise the renal function. A very important exam question. There is insufficient evidence to support the use of gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist or dopamine agonist in treating these patients. Women with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome being managed on an outpatient basis should be reviewed urgently if they develop symptoms or signs of worsening ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. In the absence of these, review every two to three days, it's likely to be adequate. And the baseline laboratory investigations should be repeated if the severity of OHSS is thought to be worsening. Hematocrit is a useful guide to the degree of intravascular volume depletion. The hospital admission, friends, the guideline says it should be considered for women, number one, who are unable to achieve satisfactory pain control, number two, are unable to maintain adequate fluid intake due to nausea, number three, show signs of worsening of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome despite outpatient intervention, number four, are unable to attend regular outpatient follow-up, and number five, they have critical ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It has to be a multidisciplinary assistance for critical and severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome who have persistent hemoconcentration and dehydration. Keep a note for your extended match question. Women admitted with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome should be assessed at least once daily. More frequent assessment is appropriate for women with critical ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and those with complication. 
analgesia and antiemetics may be used in women with ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, avoiding non-steroidal agents and medicines contraindicated in pregnancy. The fluid replacement by the oral route guided by thirst is the most physiological approach to correct the intravascular dehydration. Women with persistent hemoconcentration, despite volume replacement with intravenous colloids, may need invasive monitoring and this should be managed with anesthetic input. The diuretics should be avoided as they further deplete intravascular volume, but they may have a role in multidisciplinary setting if oliguria persists despite adequate fluid replacement and drainage of ascites. The indications of paracentesis are severe abdominal distension and pain, secondary to ascites, shortness of breath and respiratory compromise, secondary to ascites and increased intra-abdominal pressure, oliguria, despite adequate volume replacement, secondary to increased abdominal pressure, causing reduced renal perfusion. Paracentesis should be carried out under ultrasound guidance and can be performed abdominally or vaginally. The intravenous colloid therapy should be considered for women who have large volumes of fluid removed by paracentesis. Women with severe or critical OHSS and those admitted with OHSS should receive low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. The duration of low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis should be individualized according to the patient risk factors and outcome of the treatment. Women with moderate OHSS should be evaluated for predisposing risk factors for thrombosis and prescribed either anti-embolism stockings or low molecular weight heparin if indicated. In addition to the usual symptoms and signs of venous thromboembolism, thromboembolism should be suspected in women with OHSS who present with unusual neurological symptoms, even if they present several weeks after apparent improvement in OHSS. Please remember for your ASCII station and the extended match question. The surgery is only indicated in patients with OHSS if there is a coincident problem such as adenexal torsion, ovarian rupture, and ectopic pregnancy. It should be performed by an experienced surgeon. The Green Top Guideline beautifully says that the clinician should be aware and women informed that pregnancies complicated by OHSS may be at increased risk of preeclampsia and preterm delivery. Some important exam points from this green top guideline are the classification of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome management as per severity, when to give thromboprophylaxis, and it's a must ask station of your exam. Best of luck from the entire team of RFA tutors. Thank you for joining us today. See you next time. And until we meet again, take very good care of yourself. Bye bye.